Hey, hi. Welcome to Someone Else's Movie, the original podcast where an actor, writer, director, or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make. I'm Norm Wilner, senior film writer for Now Magazine, and this is The Other Thing I Do. My guest this week is Adam Naiman, a film critic, author, and actor. Uh, he played the defense attorney in Antoine Borges' Fail to Appear. He's also a dear friend. His books include It Doesn't Suck, The Definitive Examination of Paul Verhoeven's Showgirls, and Confusion and Carnage about the films of Ben Wheatley. His latest, a gorgeous hardcover tome called The Coens, This Book Really Ties the Films Together, is in stores now from Abrams Books. And Adam will be down at the Tiff Bell Lightbox in Toronto for a screening and a signing at 9.15pm this Friday, October 12th. You should go, because Adam is screening Fargo, Joel and Ethan Coen's brilliant 1996 comedy drama about a handful of people on a collision course with one another in Minnesota. You know the people. Marge Gunderson, the pregnant cop, played by Francis McDormand. Jerry Lundegaard, a hapless car salesman, played by William H. Macy. Carl Showalter and Gare Grimsrud, two petty criminals, played by Steve Buscemi and Peter Stormar, who were hired to kidnap Jerry's wife so he can ransom her back to his father-in-law. Nothing goes right, and several people die. Why? Bad choices, mostly. And the genius of Fargo, which won Oscars for McDormand's magnificent performance and the Coen screenplay, is that by the time the credits roll, we pretty much understand why everything happened. This is someone else's movie. I mean, I chose to talk about Fargo on the one hand for a very practical reason, which is we are going to screen it, the sure. Tiff Bell Lightbox, um, on Friday uh, as part of a launch for my book and also because everyone likes to watch Fargo. Sure. But for everybody listening to this after Friday. Yeah. I mean, for everyone listening to this after Friday, I think that while Fargo occupies, I would say, we'll talk about this later, a pivot point or a turning point in the Coen's career... As a teenager, it was, I think, the first of their movies that I saw in a theater. Okay. Because I would have been 15 in 1996 when Fargo came out. And Raising Arizona would have been something I saw on VHS. Barton Fink and Miller's Crossing were things that had sort of passed me by. And I think I probably watched because of Fargo. Right. And The Hudsucker Proxy, I know for a fact, I saw after. So... Fargo was the first of their films that I saw in a theater, and then obviously everyone since then I've seen in, in in theaters. But So even if it wasn't technically a first encounter with the Coens, it was a first encounter in a theater space. Okay. And also of seeing their reputation and their reception kind of inflate in real time. Because if you remember, in late 1996, that film was a big deal. Oh, I remember. Yeah, and I remember how little a deal Hudsucker was before that. Right. So this was their rebound picture. Yeah. Essentially, like they had um, Blood Simple, Raising Arizona, Miller's Crossing, Barton Fink, all critical darlings, all reasonably too incredibly successful based on, you know, budget outlays. Uh, and then they did this, their first big studio picture, Hudsucker, and it tanked. Uh, rightly so, I would argue. But I know you <laughs> like it more than I do. Well, rightly or wrongly, I think Hudsucker was received at the time as like a kind of limit case. Mm -hmm. It's like here you have these innovative, smart filmmakers. Here's their shot. And they definitely took it. Oh, yeah. They made the movie they wanted they to make. They made the movie they wanted no to make. And they made something that for a lot of people was cluttered and crowded and somewhat exhausting, like relentlessly conceptual and so annotated in a way that, I mean, maybe Barton Fink was too, but I mean, Hudsucker is just so dense with references. And I think that that certainly didn't help it with a mainstream audience. But I think even critics were sick of it by then, even though it had its defenders. Yeah. So Fargo, I mean, maybe one way to approach it before contextualizing its release and how it was made and stuff is just there was less in it, which doesn't mean that there's less to it, right. but there's less in it. It is not a film of references to other films. It is not a film of references to literary texts. It's got a lean running time. It takes place in this very empty, abstract, white space. Yeah, it's clean and it's easy to describe. Easy to describe, more so than any of their films, I think, since Blood Simple, which it resembles. Yeah, in some, yeah. which it resembles in some ways. And I would say, not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but that's also the, what the appeal of No Country for Old Men was a decade later. 
similarly coming after a series of films that had bothered people, mm -hmm. like Hudsucker Proxy and Lady Killers. It's like every 10 or 12 years they do this reset yeah. to a kind of blood, bloody, simple crime yeah. thriller. Yeah, no, and you pointed out. it's a weird way to sort of put a spine on their career. But that's something I argue in the book, and it's something that I just think, you know, the history bears out, that they sort of come back to first principles every 10 or 12 years. Yeah. I mean, even Buster Scruggs is a Western, so sort of return to, yeah, if nothing else, to no country and sure know, that to to old brother where art thou? And unfortunately, uh, I have made a promise not to talk about a promise. I saw it's stupid embargoes. I'll tell people there's an embargo. I cannot talk about Buster Scruggs, even though we've both seen it. Yeah, um, I, I can, but won't because <laughs> you know um, I don't want to get you in trouble. You'll drag me in with. But you. all all I would say to your point is, I mean, you're right. There's a bit of a return aspect in in, in Buster Scruggs as well, though I certainly wouldn't call it Spartan or spare. No, no. but in in terms of certainly, I think I can comment on the trailer, which is out there. Yeah, it's telling you that there are elements from the previous films that you will recognize and be comforted sure. by. Yeah. Uh, and when, when Fargo arrived, it was it was kind of the negative image of Blood Simple, which is mostly filmed in darkness and, and very sparse in its yeah. dialogue. Fargo is nothing but talk. Nothing but talk and also and, quite white in, yeah. in the sense of the backdrop. And also just in general. And you also know, just one character of color in the whole picture, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, and he's quite... And we'll talk about Mike Yanagita and, oh, what an, and what an outlier and what an enigma he is. I mean, again, because we're of slightly different ages and vintages... Yeah, you know, I, I had seen all of them. I, right. I was stunned at when you said that just yeah. now. Um, I, I don't know why exactly, because you are, you know, you're younger than I am, but I just assumed that you would have caught up to something. No, but because no, the, because they didn't make, I mean, they didn't make movies for 12-year-olds. Yeah, and the opportunities to see Raising Arizona even wasn't in circulation no. that much at the reps. No, and I would say also that, and I'd be interested to know what you think of this, mm. Fargo is a film that in no artistic, creative way is influenced by Pulp Fiction. But it's a film whose reception and release and popularity I locate as a very post pulp fiction phenomenon. Yeah. yeah like, I mean, like there's the superficial connection of Steve Buscemi, but it's also the idea of a violent, talkative American indie film that does the can premiere. And by the time it arrives in the fall, it's sort of preordained as like a conversation piece. Yeah. I think that pulp fiction's success had a lot to do with Fargo's. Embrace the two movies don't have much to do with Maybe. each other. Well, in that they're both, I mean, they're both about talkative criminals. I mean, it's easy to describe it that way. Ta talkative criminals, but also the flowering of this hip, ironic, vicious indie sensibility that I don't think Fargo encompasses as a whole. Yeah, but it has elements of it. Well, I think what's between the two is the usual suspects. Yes, in '95, which definitely crystallized a kind of post-Tarantino thing that Fargo doesn't have. Fargo no. is. I was going to say the thing that makes it different and that separates it out is that Fargo is sad. Fargo despairs for its characters in a way that Tarantino's films just no. don't. And, 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 and humane in places in a way that Tarantino's only really been for me and Jackie Brown. Mm. But, you know, I've always thought that the Coens and Tarantino are worth discussing in terms of some of their parallels and similarities, which is they both are deeply postmodernist. They both proceed from a position of deep knowledge about film history. I would say the Coens branch out more into literary history than Tarantino. That's fair, yeah. But, but you know, he's no dummy either. Uh, they've both been seen as quite dangerous by certain critics who think that they don't proceed with enough respect for film history, or that they proceed with too much brio and too much cruelty. I mean, there's a, there's a strain of cinephilia that sees them both that the Coens as a filmmaking entity and Tarantino as sort of the worst aspects of a filmmaker like Godard, you know, this idea of like the hit, you know, the history of cinema and the history of images and just sort of like mercilessly bending them to their whims and recontextualizing them. Yeah. I think that when the Coens came out, it was just a very, they did not make the impact with a single film like Tarantino sure. did yeah. with Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction. And now coming out the other side, though, they're almost like classicists and yeah. keepers of a flame, whereas Tarantino's now this just like weird mutant. Yeah. So they've diverged in that sense. Yeah, I mean, the first their first four films were so... The Coens' first four films were so specifically 
crafted and meticulous and a tourist. And even though Raising Arizona is a cartoon, it's a gorgeous and thoughtful one. Yes, it is. Um, that they were, yeah, they were film brats out of the gate, but they were also, they were the ones who struck me as deeply respectful of the history, the, the, the things they were playing with were sacred to them. Up, up to a point. I mean, then you have a movie like Barton Fink where it's like, well, what do they have against Clifford O'Dets? Sure. But they love Wallace Beery wrestling pictures. They do. And you can feel it. Like, yes. you can feel the, uh, and it, the and tribute. It, and in Hudsucker, they love um, Art Deco, yeah. and they love Catherine Hepburn, and they love Frank Capra. But for some people, that love was indivisible for a kind from a kind of like ownership or re-ownership. Right. And the thing about Tarantino is, I think he really, when he's good, draws you into loving things the way that he loves them. But he also annotates them in a way where, like. He, he's telling you this is what this is. I think when the Coens made Hudsucker, they didn't stop to let anyone catch their breath. Yeah, And that's also what some people's issue with Lebowski is, that it's so dense. It's like, how the hell am I supposed to keep up with this? And it, I don't think it's a coincidence that Fargo is not just, it's certainly it's not it better because it's simpler. Their complex movies are sometimes great. But I think it's popular and accessible and beloved in a way because that stuff is less present. Yeah. Um, you know, and you really focus on characters, story, and tone, which I agree with you is melancholy and sad, despite the hilarity of a lot of the, the exchanges. Well, that's, yeah, that's the thing. The tone is, is somehow not in contrast with the fact that everybody is cheerful and happy and no. murdery. Like, it's, it's pushed 10 degrees in either direction. It would be a Tarantino film. Yeah. With... You know, wisecracking hitmen and wacky cops and all this. Like you could pitch it that yeah, way and, and push twenty degrees in the other direction would be a Hallmark card. Yeah, right. Yeah. And where, more, where morality triumphs and yeah. evil is punished. And the thing that I think the thing that differentiates it is that it opens with that outright lie, uh, which is the most ingenious thing they've ever done, saying that this is all true. Because yeah. you instantly start to mean, well, it's ludicrous, but they're clearly real like this must have happened just this way because who would make it up yeah i mean who who would make it up and it's it, it's quite a gambit right yeah. i mean to some extent it ends up catching journalists and critics in a bit of a lie because they're like anyone who writes in any way you know even if it's just in synopsizing the film this is based on a true story like that's untrue yeah and so it you know it's it's it, it's making the reception of the film somewhat dishonest mm -hmm. even if accidentally i can't believe people didn't figure it out i mean i did during right. the screening because once you get to the point of burying the money and the, there's no way that like, there are no witnesses there's no and he's dead that didn't happen it's so clear that at that point that they're just eh, you know what let's see where i was i was on board i was enjoying the film but i was also clearly conscious of the fact that it was not in any way a real story but i think that by framing it as real they're trying to draw attention to the fact that the things that happen and the impulses that generate the story are quite plausibly oh, every day. Absolutely. And it makes us identify with the characters in a way that we probably wouldn't have yeah. if it was fiction. Because... If we knew going in that it was fiction. Well, because, yeah. And, and the thing, too, is it's not quite that they don't put a genre frame around it because they open the film with the, you know, this mock Lawrence of Arabia <laughs> composition. Yeah. And I've talked to Carter Burwell in my book about his score and that the first time the score cycles through, it's this plaintive folk tale, and the second time it has this bombast to it. And those are the two sides of the movie. It's the tender side and the somewhat italicized, this is a joke yeah. side. But, you know, it's framed by the Paul Bunyan statue as a kind of tall tale. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And because it's an American tall tale, it's a tall tale of violence to, to, to some extent, violence in the landscape. But I love the contrast between that bombastic beautiful music and just like him towing that second car like an albatross around <laughs> his his neck it's mock epic you know i think hudsucker was genuinely epic they were going for something inflated yeah and then in fargo i mean that opening is just so small and the cut to them in the bar is so petty yeah and then you're within a story whose size is very realistic and every day so you are testing that opening title card and being like well maybe mm -hmm. but no don't they actually say in deference to the victims or something, some some tortured language that just sounds like it was lawyered up? Yeah. It's just the, that eloquence that runs through the entire film in the dialogue, but the way they state it up front in titles is just, it's almost daring you to disbelieve them, which of course is what you should be doing. Yeah, which is what you should be doing. But I would also say that once the plot kicks in motion, I mean, everyone has different experiences in the movies. 
I mean, maybe also because I was younger when I saw it, I can't say that that question of whether or not it was true hung over my first or too many subsequent viewings of it. Though obviously as a critic or as a scholar, like you become aware of that and wonder why they do that. Yeah. And it's tied to a pattern of dissembling and lying that they like to do, like the fact that they have a fictional film editor or the yeah. fact that there's a fake film historian's commentary on Blood Simple. I mean, they do a lot of stuff like this to protect the mystery of their films right. and protect the intention of their films. And I say more power to them. <laughs> but again, I think Fargo's just so absorbing once the story starts because it's rooted in such a weirdly relatable kind of awfulness which isn't to say that I relate to the William H. Macy character, but if I say I don't and you say you don't and every guy who watches the movie says they doesn't, the movie wouldn't be as popular as sure. it is. Yeah. That greed, that little, little, little moral adjustment of like, what if I want a little more? It's quite an insidious thing to make a movie about and it goes so wrong. Yeah, but that's what always happens. I mean, always. that's the beauty of the noir engine, right? No matter what happens, the slightest deviation yeah. from absolute morality is punished by, you know, the raining down of hell on a person. But in this case, yeah, absolutely. It doesn't feel like a deviation. It's just the logical extension of what you're supposed to do. He is an unsuccessful businessman. Therefore, he should be finding ways to become successful. And it doesn't really matter how he does that as long as no one gets hurt. And then, of course, people get hurt. There's, there's just no way around it. It's no. always going to happen. And as always with them, I mean, they frame it. Well, first of all, the idea of something always going wrong. I mean, that's the opening monologue of Blood Simple. Mm -hmm. You know, and they've remained true to that now. In the same way that they've remained true to the America-Russia dichotomy in that monologue, where he's like, in Russia, they all pull together. Yeah. Here, you're on your own. I mean, that dialectic is in, like, Hail Caesar with the Russians and the Americans, yeah, and it's yeah, always yeah. there. But, you know, from the beginning, they've interrogated masculinity. And sometimes it's very overt, mm -hmm. like Lebowski opening with the man in me. Or, um, you know, in the man who wasn't there, what kind of man are you, Gandolfini in the office with yeah. Thornton? But in Fargo, I think it's that you have an opening 30 minutes populated with the exception of the kidnapping victim and the two prostitutes exclusively by men who exist in this weird hierarchy of awfulness where Macy's respectable on the surface, but totally venal on the inside. And then the hitmen like externalize that. Not that the kidnappers externalize that venality. Yeah. Like they're the part of him that he thinks he's better than, but he's not. Right. They're also really stupid but i mean his father-in-law is a successful self-made by his bootstraps guy and he's a complete asshole yep. and creates a context for macy's insecurity and greed by basically saying you know like your wife and kid don't have to worry but like you do so you see this world of men is also a world of money and a world of greed and a world of just absolute coldness and that's why I find the delay of Marge's arrival for half an hour really works. I mean, the Coens themselves probably wouldn't agree with this, or if they did, they wouldn't say so because they're not into interpretations of their work. But I've always taken Marge's first line as being really double-edged when she says, I think I'm going to barf. It's morning sickness, but it's a moral response yeah. to what's happened in the first half hour of the movie. I mean, how can you feel anything but sick watching what's happened? Macy's plan is despicable. The conduct of the people carrying it out makes it worse. Sure. And then the murder of the innocents on the highway is just, I mean, at that point, this is just hell, <laughs> you know? And it's frightening, Yeah, those scenes out on the road. They're not funny. Yeah, that's, and, and again, that's the thing that I respect about the Coens is that you could, certainly Tarantino has just made passersby getting killed kind of, interesting but sure. not emotionally fraught like the woman that mr orange kills in reservoir dogs sure flies right by but sure or the, she's... or the exploding head in the car in pulp fiction sure. which not to reroute this into a podcast about pulp fiction but american cinema changed to some extent in that scene or in the ear scene in reservoir dogs this idea that violence as an end to itself is kind of cool mm -hmm. like there's no sting in death and i think that in the in the in fargo when Stormare shoots the cop in the head, it's a bit of a punchline. And Buscemi's quite funny saying, oh, daddy, yeah, yeah. or whoa, daddy. But it's also grave and frightening. Yeah. Well, and also, of course, Fargo hides the worst act. You know, it's just referred she started screaming. Oh, yeah, well, now, oh, no, we're getting toward the yeah, end we're of the, her, her death. Yeah, but, no, yeah it, it, it's the fact that we don't see that is how the movie feels about it. But, you know, to talk about Gene, I mean... 
I have friends, people who I respect very much, who use her as a way to bring up the eternal question, not just with the Coens, but let's say with art. Sure. This question of proximity to sensitivity to and feelings towards characters. And so they see her cluelessness while being kidnapped, her her helplessness running around with the bag on her head and them laughing at her and then sort of, you know, her dispatch off screen as example of the Cohen's cruelty. And I've never felt them to be simpatico with the Stormari Buscemi characters. Yeah, I, there are other movies of theirs where I think they are closer to the people on screen. They're not those guys. No, I don't think we're supposed to enjoy her suffering. I think we're supposed to be horrified by the people who prolong it and, and create it. Yeah, with, with with the only thing that I would say is the fact that people laugh at those scenes. It's, some of it is the, the nervousness and the uncomfortableness, but it's sure, also, yeah. it, it does remind that there's a pretty common capacity for cruelty because the Buscemi and the Stormari characters, more than evil, are just mediocre. I mean, I think by the end, there's a kind of evil that the Stormari character... Comes, oh, he embodies comes something. to embody, yeah. but he is still on the spectrum less demonic than the demon biker, the apocalypse, or Anton Sugar, and he's in the middle of sure. the two of them, right? Demon biker's mostly funny demonic, and Anton Sugar is like serious <laughs> demonic. Stormari and Fargo is mostly just mediocre. He's scary, but in a really lobotomized, brain dead kind yeah. of way. Yeah, he's like a baby Sugar. Like you a know, baby you can't, you can't reason with him either, but no. you can also just avoid him. He won't come for you. Whereas the Bashemi character, I think, is quite convincingly mirrored with Macy. Yeah, you know, I think so. He's, Somebody who thinks he's in control but isn't. In thinks he's way. in control but isn't. Isn't as smart as he thinks he is. Kind of like detail oriented, but not. Well, he's at hiding. All. Yeah, they're both hiding behind the veneer of professionalism that they will happily abandon if it gives them what they want. Yeah. Otherwise, they wouldn't be where they are. Like he wouldn't have. They wouldn't. He wouldn't have accepted this gig if he didn't really want to, you know, do it. No. Like if, if he could, but, but yeah, Buscemi. I think he's a great contrast, and it, and again, it comes back to Tarantino to to, to Mr. Pink, who screams about professionalism constantly, but is ultimately the venal betrayer. Like he's the one who runs out. On well, him. you know, Buscemi has stuff that he plays well. <laughs> yeah. Supposedly a very nice guy. He is. I've interviewed him a number. Of but times. he does venal. Really well, yeah, and but, he can he can wrap it around in a movie and deliver that dialogue and does so beautifully in Fargo, where yeah, he does he is as like by the end of the movie he is literally as much a victim as anyone, but he is also able to convince the audience that he's as much a victim when he he's one of the only people in this who took the job with his eyes wide open and and who's responsible for a lot of what happened and it's funny too how the Coens always come back to this idea of money being bad Hmm. but in fargo the way they visualize it the whole disaster with the cop starts with the bills in the wallet and i mean in plot terms he's trying to bribe him but visually it's like money and then violence and the linking of money to violence in the coens is quite consistent and also the fact that money never ends up being kept in the films. The ill-gotten gains are never gotten. Yeah. I mean, Fargo, I think, has this... Of all their movies that have that, whether it's the money disappearing under the water in Hail Caesar or not knowing where the briefcase ends up in No Country. In the book, it's much clearer that Chigger gets the briefcase. In the movie, you don't see it. Yeah. I think Fargo's got the funniest one of those, which is bury the money smart... <laughs> How do you find it? Dumb. Yeah. Leave a marker. Smart. Someone else is going to find it. Dumb. Yeah. And the blood in the snow next to the money sort of rhymes with what I was saying about the wallet in the car scene. Like money and violence always in proximity in in, Mm -hmm. in their work. Yeah. And it's money that gets him killed at the end, too. And it's not even the money that he's keeping from Stormare. He has like hundreds of thousands of dollars more. Yeah. But it's like he haggling over the car. Yeah, it's all just petty humanity, which yeah. of course is why it's so believable as a true story, wouldn't it? It isn't. And and more and the moralism of the film. I mean, we'll talk more about McDormand in a, in, in a minute, but we're you know getting to the end yeah, already. Yeah, I figure Mark should show up late in this conversation. Well, as well. She, she will, but I mean, to get to the very end of her character, there's so much that goes into her character before this moment. But when she's in the car with Stormari, having somehow taken him down effortlessly, this mm. invincible monster just falls at her feet, not just because she's a crack shot, but because I think she's very much a life 
force. Her pregnancy gives her force. Her authority gives her force. I love her wordlessly pointing to her hat. Yeah. Like, this is who I am, you know, oh, to be heard over the wood chipper. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, the, the key line where she says more to life than a little bit of money. And it's funny when you say it out loud, it's prosaic. It's like a Bible lesson or like a Sunday school lesson. But in context, I find that scene, and we'll talk about the last scene in the movie later, but I find the scene in the car so sad, not for the surface reason that he doesn't understand her. We know he doesn't. But it's the way she then turns it around and says, I just don't understand it. And you realize that she doesn't understand him either. And that's the problem. These two will never understand each other, but they have to share the world. Right. These are the two kinds of people, maybe, that exist in the world. And authority that she represents is never going to quite get it. And Tommy Lee Jones in No Country for Old Men has the same problem. He talks more about it. He's very loquacious about it. Fargo mm-hmm. doesn't have his capacity for for introspection. But he can't answer her, but she can't identify with him. And she's so baffled yeah. and sad. I think, yeah, the sadness is more... Uh, important to me the fact that that mcdormand who obviously knows what they want as much as they do um just finds the way to articulate that just with a shrug or with a with a quirk of her like, like a twitch of her eyebrow yeah. to show us that she's not just saying i don't understand it but that it is a bone deep it's a truth that it's a bone deep truth which speaks to a naivete mm. that in some ways to be better than the world is to be unworldly you know, yeah. and it leads to the question of whether or not the film has a happy ending, which I don't think it does. I've recently become a parent, and I don't mean that the film has an unhappy ending because having a kid is hard. Having <laughs> a kid is beautiful. I love my my kid, but the terror of two more months. I think a lot of people see that as a cozy scene, and it is because the Coens are at their best are double edged and ambiguous. Mm-hmm. Two more months until a, ba- a kid is brought into the world that we've just seen. And the world that we've just seen, even if it's not really based on a true story, is based very much on our world. They're sure. not inventing anything. And you sort of go, boy, I really hope that that kid's parents are good. And you're like, well, they are good. Norm and Marge are good. Is that enough? Is it enough? Yeah. And to me, that rhymes so devastatingly with the end of Raising Arizona which is a movie where it's like well that is enough right we're good we deserve to have a a kid they made that when they were younger men you know and they were on the verge of that yeah and I think also the end of the man who wasn't there where we know that you know this this marriage was never going to produce <laughs> was, was never going to produce children but like you know is it better to to have a kid and be afraid to have one than to have never had the to, to have never had the chance right I find it to be heavy stuff in their films when it comes to parenting and paternity and, I guess, in Fargo, maternity. Um, Because it's not just a sight gag. You know, McDormand's frigging hilarious the way she walks and waddles and the sound that her coat makes and stuff. But I think pregnancy is not a sight gag or a side detail in that movie. It is super important. Oh, yeah. To what it's about. It's absolutely, I think. Um, It is. Yeah, it's it's weird because they're not afraid to make it funny. They're not afraid to let us giggle at the imagery but yeah no the fact that she is a massively pregnant woman running around with a revolver in the middle of this landscape of you know dashiell hammett venality yeah is and, absolutely important and a landscape i mean i i take this from this writer r barton palmer in his book on the cohen's but like a a landscape that they quite literally show at the end being fertilized by blood you know, I mean, it's not just the wood chipper. It's that the blood's getting everywhere. Yeah. You know, and that's the moment in the film where the weather's thawing a bit, too. And it's, in a way, a very biblical image of, like, ashes and ashes, dust to dust, returning to the earth. But it's also so uh, late capitalist, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, just literally the body being <laughs> ground up and, and, and consumed. And again, I mean, there, this is where their sadism comes in a bit. But the salient detail of that little sock... You know, it's like that's all that's left to Buscemi at that point is the sock. But even the sock feels like correct. Yeah. You're like, that is his sock. I know who's in that wood chipper. Yeah. Couldn't, yeah. couldn't be anyone else. <laughs> but no doubt. But old, but old, but old Steve Buscemi. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is. It is the specificity that makes it so wonderful um, that, yeah, we don't even need to see what happened. We don't need to see 
the confrontation. There's just he's just feeding someone into a wood chipper because yeah. this is the next stage of his plan, which is about as effective <laughs> as uh, as well, poor old. And I love too how long Macy uh, gets sidelined at the end, and it's not satisfying when they catch him exactly. It's just pathetic. It's humiliating. Yeah, we feel for him too because we've been spending all that time. You don't. I think that's the other thing, you know, it happens in Miami Blues, it happens in any vivid movie about a criminal, whether he's a good criminal or a bad criminal, professional or amateur, you eventually want them to win unless they're such monsters that they deserve capture. And, and yeah, he's not a good person, but he's William H. Macy. You kind of want him to be okay at the end. And watching him whine and squeal when he gets caught is just, it's crushing well i think that that's a t- i think that that weird maybe complicity some people feel watching him or or all of us to some extent feel watching mm-hmm. him which is you know the hitchcock side of suspense sure, filmmaking yeah. but i think that that's a testament to 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 macy's acting but it's also about how thoroughly he's emasculated by his by his father-in-law sure yeah. and again i think there's all these different models of masculinity in the film that are all inadequate but they're all in conversation with each other i mean the mike yanagita character um, is so fascinating for anyone who's listening who you know needs to be reminded in the film. Yeah. The Coens often like they're drum type filmmakers, and we know this, yeah. but they often have these digressions. And people have long puzzled about the part where Marge goes to see this Japanese American classmate of hers. Right. And again, R. Barton Palmer. I'm just trying to be respectful to him because while I talk about these ideas in my book, I'm the Coens are not under discussed. Sure. So to pretend that any idea about them is fully original, unless it's a bad faith idea <laughs> or about a brand new movie, right. it's hard. Okay. And he just talks about the fact that Marge only adopts traditional signifiers of femininity in that scene. She looks very nice. It's not to say she looks bad in her work clothes, but their work. Yeah. yeah. She puts on a nice dress. She does her hair. She puts on lipstick. She doesn't tell her husband that she's going to see him, nor does she tell her husband that she saw him. And even when he's on the phone, it's kind of kept from him. And he argues that while consciously there's nothing of uh, adultery or cheating on her mind, first of all, we're reminded of McDormand's adulterous character in Blood Simple. You can't help but be. Sure. But also, so why doesn't she tell him? And is she just looking for a change from the norm? Literally, her husband being Norm. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't really have to do with the case. So why is she going? Is she curious about this guy and his life? Does she want to be spoken to and treated nicely with her baby on the way? Is this like her last chance to have something that's not this life? So some of that's about her. And then when you see him, he's just another uh, Jerry. He's a weak, lying man whose dishonesty we find out is bound up very much in the way he talks about women. He stalks one and lies about being married. And to me, that's what that scene is all about. Superficially, it's the sight gag or the, 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 the walking, talking joke of the Japanese guy who's been so assimilated within this culture that he sounds like everyone else and says, oh, geez, oh, oh, golly. You know, yeah. and that's, I mean, it's funny. It's, it's ethnic caricature and it's broad and it's amusing. But I find the idea that he's, it's her distrust of him that I think makes her realize oh, that Jerry's culpable. Yeah, that's until then she takes him at his, she takes Jerry at his word. Yeah. And she has finally been given the nudge. I mean, just in terms of structure, this is the, the yes. moment of revelation where she realizes, oh, maybe he's doing the same thing. I think the reason she goes to see him is because it is a chance to reconnect with her high school self. I don't think she's planning to cheat on him. Oh, she, no, no, but no. she it, absolutely sees Mike as a chance to be that person again. Yes. Which is why she dolls herself up and, and does all of that. And but, but inside that is an impulse of not dissatisfaction, but it's the same kernel of a thing that would make a Jerry do what he does. Sure, yeah. Or the same kernel of a thing that makes Billy Bob Thornton and the man who wasn't there you know, blackmail his wife's boss to start a dry cleaning business or make Larry change the grade in a serious man. And by the way, you want to talk about rhymed images in the Cohen's filmography, (laughs) Macy erasing the serial numbers and Larry erasing the grade in a serious man, both sitting in their cluttered offices, both sort of just at their wits end. Yeah. 
you know, essentially, in Macy's case, the guy he's on the phone with is God, whereas in Larry's film, God is more God. I mean, yeah. it's an Old Testament God. But this sort of, like, this... That I find the image of erasure really suggestive. They're, like, trying to, like, fudge. Right. You know, like, it's yeah. just a little fudge. It's not a huge crime. It's You're not just stabbing. changing something that's already there. Yeah. Yeah. It's not sure. stabbing a guy in the street. It's not shooting a guy in the head. The Coens have characters who transgress that way. But in this film. In, in this fact, film. Yeah. But, you know, in Miller's Crossing, they're all gangsters. It's like a code. It's a life that they choose. Or in Burn After Reading, you know, the CIA characters are, are trained to handle... Weapons. I mean, they're not supposed to use them to kill civilians. Right. But I mean, in you know, in the case of Jerry and in the case of Larry and Sirius, man, these are these are everyday people with everyday transgressions that the Coens managed to give this incredible force, tragic weight to them. Tra- yeah, yeah. You know, tra- tra- tragic weight to them, and um, you know, it's just just really good filmmaking. <laughs> you know, those those old virtues of writing, acting, and directing they they do them well. Yeah, and casting. Because, I mean, if we're going to talk about Marjorie, we have to talk about Frances McDormand sure. in a much more uh, admiring and worshipful way. I I continue to be delighted by that performance. Um, and because, because it is a real person who sounds like a cartoon, because it is someone who looks goofy and has the mind of a steel trap, yep. uh, nothing gets past her once she sees it. Yeah. That's the thing that is really... Yeah, that's well said. Yeah, that's the thing that fascinates me about that performance is that you can see someone who is missing stuff and you watch it go past her because we know more than she does for the first half of the film. Well, I have this this taxonomy in my book which is derived from the original title of Miller's Crossing which was The Big Head. That mm-hmm. was what they were going to call it. And that the Coens often seem to be divided between big heads and kind of, you know, idiots. Yeah. You know, I mean, like... Um, Tom in Miller's Crossing is a big head, and Barton Fink is a big head. Quite literally, he has an eraser head yeah. hairdo. These people who can't get outside of their own big heads and are paralyzed to some extent. And then they have characters who are more empty vessels, like Norville Barnes and Hudsucker or the dude. Yeah. You know, yeah. where there's not a lot going on mentally, and Stuff it gives them to them to them. But they're also savants. You know, in Hudsucker, he's a vessel for genius, and in Lebowski, in a point that I wouldn't call subtle, but people still miss it. You know, they're not mocking '60s leftism. They're 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 showing that even when it's on a kind of life support in the '90s, it's still the best thing around. The dude's values have almost eroded from drug use and from being Metallica's roadie and whatever else. But he finds those values in Lebowski, and they allow him to triumph. He's the only person who cares that Bunny's missing, right? Even if she kidnapped herself, he cares. Yeah, you know, there's a humanity there. Marge is a weird hybrid. She's super smart, but not in a narcissistic male Barton way or Lewin Davis way. Mm -hmm. You know, she doesn't think she's a genius. But she's also simple, but not in a foolish Norville Barnes way or Jeff Lebowski way, because she's not ineffectual. No, she's just uncomplicated. And she doesn't get in her own way, and she doesn't get in anyone else's way until... And she ties to something that I don't want to try... And push too far, not just because of a moment where you have to be careful what you talk about in films, but also because, I mean, it might be a bit precious. But I do suggest in the book that the Coens often do align female characters with an absolute positive morality, even when it's futile. You know, I find the change that they made to the end of No Country for Old Men so moving, where in the book, uh, Carla Jean Moss flips the coin. Right. And pleads for her life, which is both, both things are fair, you know, but McCarthy sees her as a victim, this child bride who's like a settling of accounts for Chigurh and he kills her. And in the movie, the outcome is the same. They don't change the plot, but she says, uh, no. Yeah, she refuses. And I won't flip the coin. And she has a line that's not in the book where she says the money has no say. It's just you, which I've always seen as a rewrite of Marge saying there's more to life than a little bit of money. And the dynamics of those scenes are quite similar. In Fargo, Chigurh's in the backseat of the car and she's driving. Uh, Sir in the backseat of the car and she's driving. In No Country, Chigurh's got the gun and she's helpless. But they are both this confrontation with this unstoppable male evil. And the women, in their way, stand up to them. So even though the people tend to see the Coens as masculine 
identified filmmakers and macho bro auteurs, and that's not wrong. I think that it's an interesting through line that whether it's Marva and the Lady Killers, ultimately, even though what she does at the end is stupid, donating the money to Bob Jones University, she doesn't want it. Mm -hmm. And Carla Jean wants nothing to do with money, and Marge wants nothing to do with money. And then there's vicious exceptions, like like Linda in uh, Burn After Reading, Reading. also played by McDormand, who's like the anti-Marge. Yes. You know, like could not be a more hideous character. But for the most part, their women tend to resist that, Mm -hmm. whereas their men are ruled and and, and defined by it. Yeah. And is that them responding to the idea of, you know, growing up in an environment that reminded them that, or not reminded them, that constantly tormented them about being successful? And, you know, like, if a serious man is as close to their own biographies as we right. ever come, Larry Gopnik being henpecked for not being <laughs> successful enough and, and quietly desiring the life of the neighbor next door, or the life with the neighbor next door, yeah. that kind of thing feels like it came out of their own... It, flesh, right? Like it, that's something they saw when they were younger. It could, even if they're never going to admit to it in such a direct They'll never way. To anything in a direct no, way. Because as even, you well know. As I well know. I mean, but even in the case of a serious man, you know, they were coy. Like they couldn't come out and be like, yeah, this has nothing to do with us. But they wouldn't really get into it. And again, I think that in all cases, because now we're just kind of talking about the Coens in general, like it happens. It happens. But, well, because their films are also close to each other. But, I mean, I think I think it's more than fair, you know? And I would say, too, that it's a posture that their films permit them to take because if their films weren't interesting or if their films had more of a one-to-one ratio between, like, intention and realization, no one would care. Sure. You know, there's lots of perfectly talented second- or third-tier genre filmmakers who do their work and people pay them money and we pay money to see their films and we like them and we're like, oh, their camera's good or they got a good performance out of that person. But you don't spend your time thinking about the movies. Right. The movies don't create the space to think about. The Coen's movies are airtight, but they also have about as much imaginative space to move around inside as almost any filmmakers that I know. And again, it's making it sound like this is a very broy auteurist, um, you know, cosmology we're talking about. But like, they're like Kubrick in that regard, right? Where it's like the film's value, virtues are concrete, and the images are in your mind, and you know why they're good, but you think about the films right there's all kinds of ways that movies can be spacious like lucrecia martel's films are incredibly spacious and david lynch's films are 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 spacious and you know maya darren's movies are spacious but the cohen's movies even though they're micromanaged are spacious that's why people write about them and watch them multiple times they rattle around in a way that few others do. I Most of them do, anyway. Yeah, I mean, even the failures are fascinating to me, and I don't think there are that many failures. I mean, I'm one of the ones who goes to bat for intolerable cruelty just because the Wheezy Joe line still makes me smile. <laughs> but um, there is something about, I mean, specifically Fargo, there is something about Fargo that won't go away, which is amazing because it is so easily boxed up. Like, you can just sum up the movie and walk away from it and yet yep. there's a television series that, that plays with it like a Rubik's Cube and there there's the vernacular won't, well, it the just te- clings well and the television series is something that people ask why I didn't include in the book and beyond the fact that there's like just a fact a simple reason which is it's not them it's not theirs yeah that's but, but also it's a show that really bothers me which is not to say the same thing as it being bad and I haven't watched it fully. My, my wife's watched it more than I have, and I think you've watched it, and friends of mine have watched, watched it. the first season, but I never got back to it. And I guess, in a way, it's interesting to talk about Fargo through the lens of there also being a TV series called Fargo. That speaks to the cultural penetration that Fargo made. Precisely. And the fact that it's shorthand for something. I hate that the show exists. Okay. Which is not the same thing as calling the show bad, because when I've watched episodes from the first season, it's superbly acted... And I bear no ill will to the talented people who who make the show what it is. But I don't think Fargo's a brand. I think it's... And I don't just think it's a good movie. I think it's a work of art. I think it's a work of art with very clearly delineated borders, as spacious as they may be inside that. I would say their movies are like that horror movie idea of, like, the house that's somehow bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. Okay. You know, like, if you've ever read House of Leaves, they measure the walls, and it's like, how is this room bigger than the frame that contains it? So they can make a movie like Fargo that's really lean and small, as you say, and then it's gigantic. 
And I just don't like that there's a TV show that equates that with, like, snow and accents and guns and crime. Even if it's configuration of those elements or it's Rubik's cubing of them is is smart. Yeah. Even if it's good, it's not the movie. It's an infringement. It, it is. It, you know. it's, it's like the thing, the thing that I thought about when they announced, when Noah Hawley announced that he was doing it in the first place yeah. was, first of all, why? And then it didn't turn out to be a straight remake. So, okay, I kind of get it. And I guess my piece with it is that Zack Snyder said the same thing about Dawn of the Dead when he made his movie. He said, look, if this is the only way I get to make my zombie movie is to call it Dawn of the Dead and have a shopping mall in it, that's what I'm going to do. Right, and, but, the, but the steak, but, the, but those are different sets of steaks. Right, that's that's the sticking point, is right. that Fargo is still Fargo. You have, a, you have expectations and you have assumptions and it's weird. It's different from, and here's an, oh, another strange connection, Bob Odenkirk is in both of them, but you've got uh, him showing up in Fargo and then he's also, of course, the star of Better Call Saul, which is another show that technically in my mind has no right to exist, well, but I kind of love it. And I would say that Better Call Saul, at its best, evokes some of the same feeling of paralysis that Fargo does, where it's like, I'm with these guys, but I shouldn't be. Yeah, you're trapped in the same bad situation. And it's the same specific regionalism and the same mix of kind of, you know, of of comedy and and, and morality tale. I mean, I really... And I didn't really like Breaking Bad, which which I know other people do, and I don't think Breaking Bad's poor. I just didn't connect to it. Sure. But I love Better Call Saul. And sometimes Better Call Saul feels a bit Coen's to me. Yeah, very much so. Sometimes. But that so I, then the Fargo show, which I find fascinating. Yeah, but that idea of but that idea of Cohen influence is also interesting to talk about because, like with Tarantino, there was that whole period in the nineties. I mean, you rightly located Usual Suspects, even though that's not a ripoff. No, and, but it's the one that follows. I mean, everybody talks about how Pulp Fiction was the most influential, but really, it's Reservoir Dogs because that showed you could do that cheaply. Yeah, and all the remakes and and spit outs and and knockoffs came out around the same time as Pulp Fiction, so they were already put into production. Yeah, so my, Usual Suspects goes straight out straight of Straight out. Me. But my, my, my point just being that mm. we know that there were a bunch of Tarantino clones. Sure. Cohen clones are less easily pegged. Critics will often compare things to the Coens because that's just a lot of what weekly reviewing is. It's kind of like, this is like this. Yeah, oh, sure. But I think it's a little harder to copy them straight up than it is Tarantino. And I think that there's probably fewer filmmakers who we would say are like Cohen derived than there are t- filmmakers who are Tarantino derived. Maybe you disagree? No, no, I think that's fair. I think the thing that happens when people try to knock off the Coens is they end up knocking off Barry, Se- Barry Sonnenfeld cinematography. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, they do. They copy yeah. that turbocharged, it's the look. steroidal cinematography. Yeah. Or the gloss in Miller's Crossing and Barton Fink, that yeah. specific tone that they're going for. But that's not the meat, right? Like, that's just the dressing. One of the only filmmakers, and it's funny too because he exists on Twitter, though I don't think he follows me, and I'm not saying anything good or bad about him necessarily. I'm not a massive fan, but Ryan Johnson with with Brick, that felt Coensy at its core to me, whether I liked it or not. That idea of like let's play with an old genre and let's try and make it resignify, and I sort of thought that's not like Cohen knockoff in the sense that it's the casting or the camera tone. I was just like. That's a Cohen's venture, I thought. I don't. I can't think of too many more movies that I would say that about. No, I mean, there's the Polish brothers did it kind of with Twin Falls, Idaho. Kind well, of. It sort of splits the difference between the Cohen's and Lynch. Yes. Um, Who's also much easier to copy. Sure. I mean, well, those are the badly. Yeah, exactly. Those are the affectations that you can grab onto and then reuse, but you, no one gets it right. No one gets the mixture right. Right. Um, I think now any American independent film with a certain kind of intimacy and a certain kind of self-seriousness could be put in the Cohen's wheelhouse but I also think that their style is so idiosyncratic that people are smart enough not to try to copy it well well, that's what I was getting at is that maybe for a while you could sort of try but now I mean they've also just diversified in terms of like the scale and scope of what they make I mean I mean what is a Cohen Brothers movie now there's really not a lot between Miller's Crossing and True Grit 
you know, there's really not a lot between Hudsucker Proxy and Lewin Davis. Of course, these movies are also all closely linked, and that's what my very long, heavy book <laughs> gets at. But they've also now become, they've come out the other side in terms of the scale and scope and industrial placement of their movies. So, like, maybe they are just more self-contained and unto themselves. But I think there's still a lot of Tarantino ripoffs and knockoffs and Tarantino wannabes. The Coens, maybe, you're right, maybe people know enough not to copy, or maybe it's just harder to say what it is you'd be copying. Yeah, I think in that case, you could backdoor it maybe and accidentally make one, but I don't think that anyone. I mean, who would set out to make another Barton Fink deliberately? I mean, well, who well, would who would not be them? It's funny. I mean, we could. I mean, this conversation can go on forever, but I think Barton Fink. I mean, we're talking about Fargo. No, no go for but it. Barton Fink. In a way, it's not one of their best films for me. For me, but that in some ways is the movie that. No one else in the history of this medium could have made. <laughs> I don't know if that's true of some of the other ones. I mean, I mean, Serious Man is amazing, but you could you could conceivably have a coming of age film about a Jewish family in that sure. area. And Lou and Davis is really specific, but you know, like movies about asshole artists. I mean, they exist. Barton Fink is this movie. Like, who the hell makes that? Yeah. Who makes a movie about Clifford Odets and Nathaniel West and, and the and Hollywood studio Faulkner system and, all and the of those studio things, system yeah. and, 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 and Hitler? I mean, that's the uncut stuff. <laughs> that's and again, it's a lot of people hate that movie and it's not in my top five or anything. But that is the pure uncut Cohen stuff. Yeah. But it's also what I think Fargo backs off from. I was going to say the the three films in that sequence: Barton Fink, Hudsucker, and, and Miller's, and no, and, oh, and Fargo. Fargo is them receding from something. Yeah, and I think it's unconscious. Like I I probably don't think Fargo was a decision to make a mainstream Oscar winning film. No, they've ta- they framed it in totally practical terms. It's like this is what we could afford. It was the next script, right? It was the, next like, script. It was the thing they could shoot that they could afford to shoot next. Yeah. And that's, we talked about that when they came through for Serious Man is that, you know, the order of their movies is simply dictated by, oh, we had the money for this one and we had the locations for this one. Like that was their Six. argument for No Country, Burn After Reading and A Serious Man in that order, in that order. simply happened because that's how everything lined up. At least that's what they said. So since we both interviewed them on that junket, which is like 10 years ago, yeah, and that's, that's my, right. still my only interview Really? With them. Yeah, I mean, for this book... You we, didn't even get a phone... Because I got a phoner for Lewin Davis. You did, that didn't I didn't happen. try. And, yeah. I, and I'm going to try and talk to them for Scruggs. I'm going to try. Not. And I'm going to definitely try and talk to them for another larger project. And should they be listening? Hey, guys. But... Um, <laughs> I'll make sure they get this. You know, I, I thought that when I talked to them about Serious Man, I suddenly understood the films and not in... I'm not saying this in a fake way. like, I spent 20 minutes with them and yeah. I get their movie. Nothing like that. It was just... They really, really are on their own wavelength. And maybe this is just to round it off now because we've been talking for a while, but the wavelength that they were on had to do with Fargo and not Serious Man. That's why I like telling this story. Not, it's not a great story, but it's just funny. It's that so we're talking about Serious Man. And they had no interest in talking about the metaphysics of it. Yeah, I had that same experience. And they had no interest in talking about the question mark on Dybbuk on the end credits I was like I bet I'm the only person who noticed they're like yeah people have asked us that I'm like fuck <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I was talking about music and about the soundtrack in Serious Man and the and then they kind of relaxed a bit they're talking about why they chose certain songs they're talking about Jefferson Airplane and it just started drifting in this insane way back to Fargo and the Jose Feliciano okay. scene and they just started I mean, I didn't end up putting it in my piece, and this is a tape, so I don't know if I have this tape somewhere in my <laughs> office, but it's kind of essentially not talking to me, talking to each other, being like, yeah, remember Hose? They're calling Jose Feliciano Hose. <laughs> They're talking about shooting his concert scene and what that was like. And it was like affection and maybe like a little bit of, not contempt, but like a little bit of mockery. Because, I mean, that scene, Jose Feliciano, like he's a cliche. Yeah. You know, and like, it's not a cool show to be at. No, the film presents him very much that way. The film presents him very much that way. But, you know, it's really him and he's in on it to some degree. But I found that when they started getting into this private language of talking about Jose Feliciano and drifting away from our interview, not disrespectfully, not in a hostile way. And they snapped right back when I started asking them about other stuff. They, they came back. Yeah. I thought, well, that's definitely them. They have each other. And any time compromise or reality intrudes 
they have each other as a buttress against yeah. that. They armor up that They way. armor up. And their films are uncompromised, I think, because they really, in the end, have to work it out with each other. I interviewed numerous of their collaborators for this book, all of whom, I should say, and this isn't this is something evident for me in the interviews, speak about Joel and Ethan Cohen in the most respectful, affectionate regard, totally in contrast to the media idea that they're dicks. Oh, they're not dicks. Totally in contrast to the media idea that they are somehow imperious and disrespectful. That Their collaborators have nothing but nice things to say about them. And they say that they're very giving as collaborators, that they want people's input. But the reason that they ask for people's input is because they know exactly what they want and tell everybody. And then it's within that frame. Okay, what have you got? Yeah. What do you want to do? They do not have improvisation on their sets. They do. They don't have deleted scenes, man. I I mean, they don't have deleted scenes. Great filmmakers of all kinds, whether Spielberg is your idea of a great filmmaker or Mike Lee is your idea of a great filmmaker or Catherine Bigelow or Spike Lee, they all have movies that we know got kind of broken, right? Yeah. And ideas got added later or we found this in the editing. That's not the Cones. <laughs> they, their storyboard guy, J. Todd Anderson, told me that they draw the entire film together and then <laughs> eight to 11 months later, he watches the movie. He's like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> He's hilarious about it. He's like, yep, <laughs> that's it. And so this is the Hitchcock thing, right? Like where he would, the movie was in his head and the worst yeah. thing about it was making it real. It is the Hitchcock thing. And, and it sounds like for the people who work with them, it's I mean, the worst part. I mean, it's the best part. It's the work part is, sure. is the making it real. So like in a way, that's a very top down micro managerial directorial style. But there's also something about it that I find pretty um efficient because they then don't tell their collaborators how to do their their job right you know what carter burwell told me and what mary zophris told me what roger deakins told me a bit more cagely because i found deakins to be well very very nice and friendly i found him to have a little reticence about opening up the vault yeah he's a protector a bit. he's a bit of he's, he's a bit of a protector but the, with, close yeah but i mean burwell is so candid and such a sweet guy He's like, sure, we talk about this stuff. Sure, they screen movies before they make their movies. Sure, certain things are intentional. Like, don't believe that they're not. But we're just trying to serve the story and serve the characters. And when they ask me to write a score, they let me write the score. And it's kind of what Zofra said. And it's kind of what Jess Gontor said about the, the production design. And I find all that... It's not the only way to make movies, and the Cassavetes way works, and the Kubrick way works, and whatever, but the way that they make movies seems pretty nice. Yeah. And if, you know, I, I've always believed that you can tell by the filmography after a certain point, like, if these guys are assholes, same people won't work with them. No. And you build your stable, and either you are such a martinet that you drive everyone to do the thing you want them to do, like Kubrick did. Yeah. Or you are just like, hey, guys, like Cronenberg. It's like, hey, let's hang out and make something. Yeah, That's the, the vibe that you get from the Coens, which is not a comparison I would make to David Cronenberg in any other way for their work, but that's no, but part of it. Right? No, but actually, Coens and Cronenberg, I get that yeah. comparison. He doesn't have a twin, or he doesn't have a second, <laughs> cr- that we know of, sure. uh, a second Cronenberg. I assume it's can, a Kuwato situation. Yeah, that he can use as a buttress against outside influence, but, you know... There's a certain satisfaction and pride, I think, that Cronenberg takes in finding the resources and the finances and the energy to do his own thing. And then it's very much his thing. And the only times that he's ever sounded unhappy have been when films have not ended up being his thing. Right. You know, like he's proud of the dead zone, but that's not his thing. You know, Videodrome is. Sure. And The Fly is, and Dead Ringers is. Yeah, and Dead Zone is still one of the most Cronenberg movies. It, it is. just isn't the movie he no, wanted it to but be. But it's not his thing. Yeah. And I think the Coens maybe have the best batting average I can think of on a long enough timeline of directors who've not really had to compromise. But I still think you can tell. I still think if you look at it, I mean, I know you're a defender. I still think if you look at Intolerable, intolerable cruelty, cruelty. I would bring up the Lady Killers. Or exactly. Lady Killers. Yeah. There's. There's yeah, this, there's I, I, a window in there where they weren't doing exactly what they wanted, and you can absolutely feel it. Yeah, you can absolutely feel it. Although what you also feel is the incredible will and skill that they put into those films to make them their thing, and to get them, whether it's halfway there or three quarters of the way there, or sometimes in certain moments fully there, that's just because of who they are. Yeah. Like, they've never phoned one in. 
No, I think that's absolutely fair. They've never phoned one in. But there are times where you can tell this is material that is of deep concern to them. And I think that that turn towards a, towards seriousness has, I think, had a really positive effect on the films because I'm actually someone who finds the late run... I don't know if it's a question of best, because we've just spent all this time talking about Fargo, which is clearly one of their best <laughs> films. But for me, the stuff since No Country, those are the most spacious movies. Like, Lebowski's my favorite, but boy, oh boy, <laughs> Lewin Davis and, and, and True Grit and, and, uh, and Serious Man are big, open, yeah, big, open films to rattle around inside. True Grit is the one. I mean, I... I... I do think Serious Man is probably their single most entertaining film because it hits me in that sweet spot yeah. of Midwestern Jewish culture. That, that's like I was born the year before that movie starts and or yep. the year after, and I lived the. I those guys are my parents, and I I've lived a lot of those places, and and that was when we were talking, um, and we went over this with uh, in Pat Thornton's episode. Um, I think now officially the Coens are the filmmakers who had the most movies on the show and I'm yeah. not surprised because no. people just love them so they, much they do yeah um, but Serious Man is like the, we talked about the production design when I did the interview because that those the little Karen K. Emmett box on the rabbi's desk <laughs> is something that I saw yeah and you know I grew up with in Hebrew school when I was a kid and hated the whole thing but I recognized the pieces and when I brought that up they just said oh yeah we can't take any credit for that our set designer or set decorator figured it all out and I was like come on guys it's there because you knew it worked when you were presented with it, but they'll 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 aver they'll they'll defer responsibility and yep. deflect because they don't want to talk about their own childhood, and it's probably my favorite movie because it is the closest to them in a film that you'll see. But that said, True Grit haunts me, and it was a film I had no interest in because really Jeff Bridges and that movie that story, and yet they turned it into something magnificent. Yeah, and it, and and it is it is quite magnificent and. Again, we're not going to talk about Buster Scruggs, but th- there's a, a death tinged aspect to those two films oh, yeah. where, again, you you escape into the past, but I don't think you escape into the past in an escapist way. You know, you you escape into past, but you are still haunted by the future and by the idea that all futures <laughs> are the same. Yeah, you know, and maybe that's one of the things that for me just suits me temperamentally about the Coens, which is. I'm not at all obsessed with death in that cliched Woody Allen way, but I find that works that don't try to deny those realities of life yeah, and that fear and that anxiety that is what drives people to do both good and bad things is the knowledge of an ending. And I find that maybe the Coens are better with endings than any filmmakers that I know. They, they're, they're right up there. So we're talking about Fargo and we're talking again about the double-edged aspect of those final lines. But when I think about filmmakers who've made enough movies, like 10, 15 films, their endings, by and large, are stunning in a way that other filmmakers... I mean, Cronenberg's good with them, too. <laughs> but the Coens, I think, are better at endings than anyone. And that's because they always know exactly where the movies are going, even if it doesn't seem the characters do, or even if it doesn't seem the audience does. I mean, again, not to go on about Serious Man, but... How oh, can no, that... It can't go on another second. It, it has to stop. How can that... You, you find yourself thinking, on the one hand, how can that image suddenly arrive? And on the other hand, going, but it's the movie. Yeah. And of course, not to step on this if this was in your Serious Man episode, God is in the parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> when... He's pissed off. When the first there. rabbi says, Larry, look at the parking yeah, lot, yeah, God's yeah. there, you're like, that's dumb. End of the film, they deliberately frame the tornado yep. over the parking lot. And that's where you sort of are like, guys, you're too smart. You're, you know, <laughs> just just fuck off. You're 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 too smart. Um, but the I mean, ending of Fargo, though, that that grace note that isn't a grace note. Yeah, that's their thing. That's what it is. It's yeah. a grace note that's not a grace note. It's a happy ending that is infused with dread, or it's a scary ending with a possibility of comfort. And I know that that's a semantic thing I just did, and you it's <laughs> cute. No, but it, but it, but that's it's what it is. But you're it, absolutely but, right. But but it's true. And, um, you know, I find that last scene of them in bed to be quite fair, you know, this modest little triumph of the stamp. But you'll notice he doesn't ask her about her day and he needs reassurance and he needs to be propped up. And it's even about money in the sense that it's the tree cent stamp, 
you know. And kudos to John Carroll Lynch, an actor who... Oh, he's marvelous. On my short list of, he is never bad in anything. I have this little list of, like, it's not that they're the greatest actors or they give the greatest performances, but, like, who is never bad in a thing? Yeah. And John Carroll Lynch, I've never seen be bad in, in anything. There's much greater and more famous actors than him who I've seen be bad. You know, he's never bad. Sure. He's really, really good. But just this and Zodiac together, it's like, sure. what actor wouldn't want that filmography? Those yeah. two roles. You've you've, so you've done Zodiac on this podcast, I have not. right? Oh, you no, have. It's one of the few Finchers that we haven't. Ugh, done. that's what I should have chosen. Forget <laughs> the Coens. Zod- Zodiac is 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 the best. Maybe Matt, to end. We're or, married to this now. Yeah, we're no, we are. We've been talking. Maybe to end, I'll just ask: Do you have a? I'm asking you. I mean, then I'll I'll give mine if sure, I can think sure. of one. You have a favorite line in Fargo? It's such a quotable film. I know what mine is, but I want to hear. I don't know that I do. I think. Like she started screaming is is the line that haunts is the line that is just horrible and right for that moment yeah. is the thing you need to hear it's in order horrible. to make sense of it but that's the one like that the simplicity of that line is the one that I w- I would go for that or maybe yeah no all like all of Marge's monologue at the end maybe yep. but no I think yeah I think just that or or just for the sheer weirdness of the left fieldness of it is the unguent line well, which you is just, so you, silly well that was mine yeah I was gonna say it, I need unguent which I, is alien which when is it comes alien. out of him it's like what the fuck is happening yeah. where are we in this world I know that that was the that was, that's mine it's a word that has always <laughs> I think the first time I saw Fargo as a teenager I didn't know what unguent was <laughs> and it there's something about it. You're right. It's alien. It's strange. And yet... It's destabilizing. It's destabilizing, but it feels so real. Mm. So, yeah. for some reason, you're like, that is what Gare Grimsrud <laughs> in that moment would say. But it's the fact that they can balance suspense, terror, incongruity, and just like linguistic... <laughs> what is the perfect word? Yeah. To, to, to use to both break and weirdly mount the tension in this moment. Yeah. I need unguent. It also reminds us that, in a weird way, we're, we're surrounded by the descendants of Scandinavians. Like of course. the pure version of this. Of right? course. Like, it's the thing that's never stated. Yeah. That he's there, he is the chigger of the story, he's there to create violence and chaos and destabilize whatever happens, but he is the alien force in a place that is built from his DNA. Yes. Which is such a great, weird thing that it took me ten years to figure out. Yeah. I think maybe when the Blu-ray came out, I, it hit me. It's just like, oh, yeah, right. He's the original version of this. He's well, the brutality that they've all tried to repress. Well, and that, yes, he is. And that's where, when we talked about the whiteness of Fargo, I mean, as a visual motif, but also that completely deracinated landscape. Because yeah. this is something that people have brought up to them. And I wasn't totally thrilled with how they handled that on the Hail Caesar junket, where they were like, we don't make movies about green people, and we don't make movies oh, about Martians. Right. I mean... The point that he was driving towards, whether it's a version of write what you know or whether it's a version of don't tokenize, like, I think it comes from a very defiantly artistic place of, like, don't tell us what to make movies about. But it does speak to the fact that aside from the Lady Killers, which in some ways is really incorrect and in other ways is quite daring in terms of trying to deal with a kind of African-American, African-American not just existence, but like gradations within the community and like black on black racism and also the legacy of the Freedom Riders, which is so funny with J.K. Simmons. But I mean, for the most part, their films are pretty white, you know? And when they've cast non-white actors, it has often been in counterpoint roles or comic relief roles, like I'm thinking of of Intolerable Cruelty with Gus Petch, you know, with, you know, gonna gonna nail his ass or, or stuff like that. But I mean, in Fargo, yeah, it's the location dictates that, and yeah. that's why the Mike Yanagita character is so effective. Yeah, it's no even their unconscious choices serve the story, and this and specifically in Fargo, but most of the time, I think you, you can track back on their decisions and see, oh, of course, it had to be this because in the end, the film is so good. Yeah, because it re- it retroactively justifies all their choices because it worked, right? And if you're looking for the thing in the moment that works, they are the ones who find that so much more and often. do you think maybe maybe again maybe close on this like so no country's the one that won the oscar right the big so, one so yeah. that's the that's the oscar winner lebowski is undoubtedly the cult classic and then we've talked about serious man maybe subjectively as critics as being within the conversation for best i'd say the same thing about lewin davis someone else might say a different film mm-hmm. but is fargo the kind of like 
Is that the enduring American classic? Because unlike No Country, it has a bit of a heart and a bit of humor to it. Is that the one... Is it the one that they'll be remembered for? Which is not the same as saying best. I was going to say it's the one you would I would put forward to introduce people to them. Yes. So maybe then it is. Maybe it is. I mean, it's the it's the utility player, right? It's got everything. It does. But yeah. it's also distinct. And it's, I mean, certainly Lebowski has become culturally current in the same way that you can say Fargo and everyone knows what you mean. But... Lebowski is also weird and alienating, and if you're not high, you probably won't get the most out of it. You know, there are a million excuses for Lebowski. Fargo yes, there's a, there's, a, there's a million excuses for Lebowski, and I think that there are even excuses for No Country, because it's so brutal yeah. and relentless and unrelieved in what it's doing. So it's kind of exclusionary for people who aren't into that already. It is, and I've had people, when I've done lectures and stuff on the Coens, or, or people have asked me to show films... They find it to be off-putting. They don't think it's bad, mm. but they're but but Fargo. It's like very judicious in the violence, yeah. And it and it's and it has the sweetness to it, even if the sweetness curdles a bit, or even if the sweetness is a pretense at times. Uh, I, I think because of Marge, it has the strong moral center that people want in a kind of American classic, yeah, film. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it. I think it's the one. It's well, certainly there's something in it for everyone, and it's presented in a way that no one can really disagree with it. I mean, people will say Lebowski or No Country or even A Serious Man, it's not for me. Yes. This is for everyone. No one could possibly say Fargo, ooh, that's not my taste. Yeah. Unless you're from Minnesota and you take it as a personal slight. Well, or to respect the critics who didn't like the film or friends of mine who yeah, don't. But they're wrong. Well, I, I would it's say it's so. It's just us. It's just us. You can say it. You can say it. But it's also the idea, again, of like, is it cruelty to the to the milieu? And I know that reading about Fargo, you know, the Coens found it very funny that people were telling them that they were being mean to this community and to these characters because it's their home. Yeah. And they said, we're not inventing anything. You know, they, they said that, that that exaggeration is not total. So when the, the question is the same way people get into this with Alexander Payne. You know, it's like, is it that he's mean to his characters or are you projecting the fact that you don't like these characters and blaming the filmmaker for it? Right. You know, is it the filmmaker's fault that you feel contempt for these kind of middle American rubes? Yeah. And, oh, my. Oh, I can't say it, but there's a Buster Scruggs thing, the Scruggs thing that lines up with this perfectly. Yeah, well, there's there's a bunch of them, but that'll be, a, you, you know, that'll be someone else's movie. No kidding. It's, and I await it eagerly. Yeah. Um, I, I, have we? I think I think I can't imagine we've. I don't can't imagine there's ever been a more comprehensive discussion of Fargo. I that feel was, good about it. That was, that was pretty good. Uh, is there anything though? And this is the dumb question, obviously, in conclusion. But is there anything of Fargo specifically that you have borrowed or stolen or, or picked up on? Do you? I mean, obviously, you're not making movies, so that question doesn't apply. But no. and your book is about it. It is way. about it. But is there anything that you've taken away from it? personally that you use and incorporate it into your own life well Moral you, rectitude. i've learned how to not steal cars <laughs> from a lot good or how to not have my wife kidnapped i mean so it's a cautionary tale ca- well cautionary tale i don't know i think that um you know what do we take for movies right i mean you know, it's a good it's a huge question yeah 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 you know what what do we take from them do we take this is what you do this is what you don't do I think that seeing Fargo as a teenager, I could not identify with Macy. And I don't mean now at 35 than I, that I do. But I, have a, I am married and I have a kid. And so now when I think of Fargo and what I take from it, I try to understand what he's doing. And maybe what's disturbing about it and what makes it a great film is maybe you don't have to try that hard. Right? Yeah. That's not me saying that I feel this way in some small scale non movie version of it. But you don't have to try that hard because they understand that human need for that tiny little bit more, which will never be enough. The second you want the one thing, it's all too big. And they keep re articulating that. Even if it's something like the search for truth in Serious Man, or even if it's the need for validation in Lou and Davis, that what you have is not going to be quite enough. And because Fargo is so double-edged, I don't know if what I take from it is a cautionary tale against that, or, or it's just like whether you caution against it or not, that's just the human condition, so deal with it. Yeah. 
But because I'm not an artist and because I'm not a filmmaker, I can't take something from it to apply to, to, to my own work. Were I to make a movie, I think it would probably end up being closer to something like Serious Man because I tend to be very abstract minded. I, I, I think that, you know, Fargo's like an object lesson in how to make an almost perfect movie, but I wouldn't have the first idea on how to like pick up the camera. So it, it doesn't, <laughs> it, 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 it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter. I hope it doesn't matter isn't the thing you take away. No, it doesn't matter is what I take away from some of the other <laughs> Coen's. Well, I mean, what else are you supposed to take away from Serious Man? I mean, in a strange way, the, the thesis of that film is, eh, <laughs> it doesn't matter. But being nice wouldn't hurt. Yeah. In a, in a strange way, being same nice wouldn't hurt. Same for Fargo. Yeah, yeah in, a, in, a, in, a, in a strange way, same for Fargo. But I, I don't know. I mean, it's rare that you have critics on this podcast, right? Because the yeah, whole point is right. you're supposed to have actors and filmmakers and writers who actually do something. And then, you know, I got a big tent. You have a big tent. Well, but I mean, maybe what you t- maybe what we t- I take away from Fargo, what you take away from Fargo or from movies that we love is wanting to do them justice within our own discipline. And that if so much thought and care has gone into a movie like Fargo and you feel like you've caught a lot of it and you want to be like, hey, guys, yeah, that's what's in there, yeah. you know, and that's not the same as wanting to solve the movie. No. It's just wanting wanted, to give credit where it's credit where it's due. Yeah, and share the experience of appreciating it. Yeah. Which is, I mean, you literally wrote the book on it. I did, and uh, it's a big, heavy book. <laughs> and if anyone's listening to this, it would make an excellent Hanukkah present <laughs> for the little serious man or, sure. seri- or serious woman in your life. Um, but yeah, I, I, um, I, I, I tried. And uh, I don't know, there's 16 movies. I feel like if... If they read the if they read the book, maybe they'd like like two chapters, <laughs> and that's a decent batting average. And I'll, I'll I'll take it. My thanks to Adam Naiman, whose new book, The Coens: This Book Really Ties the Films Together, is available now in stores and online from Abrams Books. He'll be introducing a screening of Fargo in Toronto this Friday, October twelfth, at the Tiff Bell Lightbox at nine fifteen p.m. That will be good. You should go to that. You can find Adam on Twitter at Bro From Another all one word, B-R-O-F-R-O-M-A-N-O-T-H-E-R, and you can find Fargo on Blu-ray and DVD from MGM Home Entertainment. It was also reissued in a spiffy 20th anniversary Blu-ray steelbook last year with a few extra goodies from Shout Factory, and it's also available on iTunes and Google Play. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Norm Wilner, and elsewhere on the internet at NowToronto.com. You can also find this podcast on Twitter at Semcast, S-E-M-Cast, and on the web at SomeoneElsesMovie.com. If you want to leave a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts or wherever you enjoy the show, that would be greatly appreciated. Every little bit helps. It truly does. Thanks for your support, and thanks for listening. I'm afraid you're just too darn loud.